Good morning, everyone. Welcome aboard to another edition of the Fact Hunters Radio Broadcast for this July 18th, 2022. And for those tracking at home, it's day 859 to flatten the curve. Hang in there, guys. We are live uh, from a warm and sunny, beautiful mid-Atlantic region. Uh, very, very busy weekend. Uh, did a lot of updates on the computer. You guys know last week after the... Uh, Coincidentally, after the Jeremy Brown interview, we had some technical issues, so a lot of time this weekend traveling around to family events, but also doing a lot of uh, updates on the old computer. seems like everything is working just fine. Uh, the schedule for this week, standing by from ChinaStrategies.com, friend of the show, uh, Stefan Verstappen, ChinaStrategies.com. Wednesday, Speak for Your Radio co-founder Paul English will be joining us. And Friday, making his return, is our co-host. We may actually have another guest with Mark, but uh, Mark Warheit will be uh, returning this Friday. Uh, joining us today, our guest is Stefan Verstappen. He is a Canadian author, researcher, and adventurer. He has written dozens of articles for various magazines and newspapers, and he is the author of eight books, including The Way of the Warrior, The 36 Strategies of Ancient China, and the act of urban survival. He has worked as an instructor for the St. John Ambulance, a wilderness guide, a community organizer, and a martial arts instructor with over 35 years experience in martial arts, including four years spent studying in China. He is the creator of the viral YouTube documentary, Defense Against the Psychopath, which I believe has close to half a million views and uh, the Paradise Stolen uh, series, which I watched last night, it is tremendous. It's just, I think it's six videos. They're all between like five and eight minutes long, uh, as well as 200 other videos. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welc uh, welcome the Renaissance man himself, Mr. Stefan Verstappen. Good morning, sir. How are you today? I'm doing good, George. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I appreciate you being on here. Um, for people who may have not heard of you before, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, your background, and what led you uh, in your journey where you are today? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Which may take the entire first hour. Yes, I'll take up the whole entire first hour. You know, I, I hate I hate that question. <laughs> no offense, George. No, but no, I know. It's you know when you ask me to talk about myself because uh, it, it just all sounds so egotistical and and self. Engrandizement, or engrandizing, I believe is the verb. But yeah, well, you know, listen. Um, I was born with a conscience. I cannot do bad things. I know this sounds weird, but ever since I was a young child, I always knew right from wrong. And I believe our purpose on this planet is to do good, is to leave it a better place than you found it. And so I, I've been trying to make the world a better place in my own little way. I, I don't have any grand ideas of changing the world, but I try to, wherever I go, wherever I live, wherever I meet people, I try to leave them better off than when I first met them or when I first moved there. Now, we are at the battle at the end times of the world right now. I mean, I don't know what other way to describe it. Yes, sir. It is the biblical Armageddon Ragnarok battle between good and evil. And now, I've seen this battle coming for over 20 years. And that's when I entered the fray as originally sort of like a truther and um, truth teller, especially after 9-11. I was, uh, you know, uh, very vocal about my suspicions about that obvious false flag staged event and uh, I realized then that this is it now you know the forces of Mordor have gathered and they have made their first strike on freedom and humanity and goodness and so you gotta take a side folks um, I took a side 20 years ago I've been doing whatever I can to make the world a better place, but also to fight this unbelievable level of evil and corruption that our society is faced with right now. And so everything I've done has been towards, for at least for the last 30 years, has been done in, in, uh, in the hopes of making things a little bit better. We all gotta stand up right now. Uh, I know that's kind of preachy and all that, but listen, if we don't win this battle against Mordor, against Sauron, <laughs> as you can tell, I'm a friend of Lord of the Rings. If we, 
if we are a fan, if we can't win this battle, what we are facing is the thousand year dark age. Your descendants, your children and your grandchildren and your great great grandchildren will live in absolute fear and tyranny. And if you can go to your grave knowing that this is the kind of world you left to your descendants, then good riddance to you. But I can't do that. And so this is what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do in my own humble way. That's really well said. And uh, two things I'd like to take away from that. Number one is you're spot on. Everybody should, wherever they fall in, whatever part of life they touch, they should make it better than when they first found it. And if everybody just pitched in and did that, what a, what a, what a wonderful a wonderful world we would live in, right? Yeah. Um, and I have said many times, if we are going to make any change, people need to, st uh, to start doing things out of their comfort zones. Um, people have become, I don't, I don't want to speak for everybody, but in the grand scheme of things, we've become comfortable with our devices, with you know air conditioning and automobiles and all these things. And are people really willing to risk their comforts for, for their, their liberty and their freedom right now? Which, and again, what you said, if we do not stand up now, because the time is now, not next week, not next month, right now, our children and our grandchildren and, and so on and so forth, are going to be paying for this for a long time. And they will be cursing your name. Yeah, yeah there's no standing on the sidelines. You know, there's no, well, you know, it's, it, I, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to take it easy and watch from the side. No, no. You, you either choose the side of virtue, and again, I'm quoting like Confucius and the Eastern philosophers, and, and the Stoics. You know, they say you, you have to live a life of virtue. This is the primary purpose of you being on this planet is to live a life of virtue. You either choose to live a life of virtue or you're on the side of evil. There is no in between. Yeah, there's no sitting on the fence at this point. Uh, I wanted to start off, I wanted to discuss a little bit. Uh, you have something on your website right now called The Complete Guide to Forming Communities with Stefan Verstappen. And uh, it's very impressive. You, you have made this complete guide uh, and it says everything you need to take your freedom into your own hands create mutual aid support and survive the coming collapse when did you write this because as you read through this it's what we're living today yeah I know um, and I'm not finished the book I'm still working on it my god I'm a year behind on completing this book and that's because it's such a complex topic but let me let me go back. Um, I've also been, among other things, a survivalist since I was 12 years old. Um, I grew up in the 60s. We had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, people really believed that we were facing a nuclear Armageddon. Uh, when my family bought their first house back in 1963, you had an option. Do you want a garage or do you want a fallout shelter? That's how prevalent the, the concept of a nuclear Armageddon was. And while it affected me as a child, we, we had all the movies and all the TV shows all depicting, you know, nuclear holocaust. Right. And so I started prepping back then, you know, I, and uh, I joined the Outward Bound uh, Society or uh, Club, which was a three-year course on wilderness survival. And uh, after that, I went on to teach uh, wilderness and bu bushcraft. Um, all is a part of my ability to survive the nuclear Armageddon. Then I joined the St. John Ambulance, which is the Canadian-British Commonwealth equivalent to the Red Cross, although I also worked for the Red Cross. We did disaster simulations and, and emergency first aid. and So, uh, you know, I was ready to deal with a disaster from a medical point of view, from a first responder's point of view. Um, and then I studied martial arts because you got to be tough. You have to be a warrior right now. And so I studied martial arts for like eight years, and then I went to China, and I studied there for another four years, and I've been teaching for almost 40 years now. Uh, and again, it's part of the survivalism. If you're going to survive what's coming, you can't be a weak person. I'm sorry. If you're... If you like comfort too much, you are not going to survive what's coming. So you have to be tough. You have to be a warrior. And that's why I wrote my book, The Way of the Warrior, um, which is 
uh, which is a philosophical, let me just close the window here, mm -hmm. which is a philosophical approach. It's, it's like stoicism. You have to be tough in order to survive what's coming. And also, you know, Socrates said of all the virtues, courage is the first virtue you need because without courage, you cannot have any of the other virtues. And again, like I said, I follow Confucius and the Eastern philosophy and, and, and the Stokes. And they all emphasize virtue. Now, why do you need courage to be a virtue? Huh. Well, just go out and try and tell the truth. Go out and be a good person. Go out and do a good deed and you will see the entire world turn against you with hatred and ma uh, malevolence and if you can stand up against that, then you have courage. Without courage, you cannot do anything. And so my book, The Way of the Warriors, is to try and teach people courage. Before that, I wrote The, the Art of Urban Survival, which is based on my study of historical cycles. We know that we are at the, at the end of a four-stage cycle. All civilizations go through this, no exceptions, 200, 250 years and every civilization faces a collapse. We are facing a collapse, as is obvious now. And so I wrote this book on what's going to happen when you face collapse. And so I tried to provide information for people to deal with and survive those various elements that take place during a collapse. For example, the first couple of chapters is on crime and deception and psychopaths. Then we move into natural disasters because for some reason when evil and corruption takes over the world, you have an increase in natural disasters. It's bizarre. There's always a correlation. I don't know why that happens. In China, they would call that losing the mandate from heaven, which means that if a country experiences a lot of natural disasters, that means God is unhappy with the leadership and in China would be a God is unhappy with the emperor and that always spelled the end of the dynasty. We are at the end of the dynasty here too and so we will see lots of natural disasters and so the book The Art of Urban Survival will also show you what to do during various natural disasters and then we get into the human made natural disasters which is crime, corruption, riots, um, martial law, war, and how to live through that. So that's what I've been trying to do. I see the writing on the wall, as do many people. It's obvious. It doesn't take a great genius to see what's coming. And so I try to prepare for that, and I try to offer information to people that they could prepare for that. So I started off with the art of urban survival, and then I realized you know, the only way people are going to be able to implement the advice from my first book, or, well, actually, technically it's my fourth book, but from that book, is to have the courage and the inner strength to actually do what needs to be done during these harsh times. And then finally I realized, or I, through my research of history, because what, what I wanted to do was find out what happened in the past when civilizations crumbled and, and, and destroyed itself. What, what did the people that survived do to survive? And the final answer to that question is they formed small autonomous communities, parallel societies. Because as our civilization collapses, we need to form our own parallel societies to replace all the things that civilization used to provide, such as health, food, shelter, security, communications, all those things are going. You know, we're facing a global famine. We're also f facing a massive crime wave. We're facing economic destruction, which will just make everything, of course, even worse. It will increase the crime. We're looking at food riots. We're looking at looters. And during these times, guaranteed the police will not be there. There will be no 911. 
Uh, the cops won't be arriving at your house to, to shoo away the home invaders. That's up to you. You're on your own. Also, medical. Look at already what's happening. The medical system here in Canada has collapsed. Now, so much for free medicine, okay? Um, if you're sick, you can expect to wait two years to go see a doctor. It's ridiculous. It's over. You cannot rely on government medical or the Rockefeller medical system to do anything. So that's up to you. You have to figure out how to provide for your own medicinal needs. And then finally, security. Um, they're going to be going crazy. You need to form uh, neighborhood watch communities. You need to work together with your neighbors to protect your neighborhood. I know it sounds paranoid, but this is what happens every single time. And if you think I'm off, uh, I'm being too paranoid, study what happened in Venezuela. Study what happened in Bosnia or what happened in Chile. There were no cops. There were looters. Crime went through the roof. Everybody carried a gun or they were victimized. Everybody was robbed. Every home was invaded. Every farm was looted. You have to do this for yourself. So the final key to surviving the collapse of our civilization is to work together, form small, independent communities. Start with two, three people. Grow to five people, ten people, ten families. Work together, and then you can provide for your own meals, your own food supply, your own medicine, your own communications, that's another thing, of course, you know, when they cut down the uh, internet or when you have, you know, two hours of electricity per day, there won't be any cell phones, there won't be any telephones, there won't be any internet. How are you going to find out what's going on? How are you going to get in touch with people around you? You need to set up your own communication systems. And so I talk all about all of that in my upcoming book, The Complete Guide to Forming Communities for Mutual Aid. That's what our great-grandparents did. They formed mutual aid societies, what they called friendly societies. And they provided our great-grandparents with everything we have now. Health insurance, retirement, unemployment insurance, scholarships, farms and co-ops and food co-ops and even entertainment and picnics and fairgrounds. They did all that themselves long before the government took it over. So we need to do that again, and um, that's what the book is. Now, I have a online course through Autonomy with and, and the University of Reason, Richard Grove's uh, um, operation, and it, it's a, like a 10-hour course. So if you go to my website, formingcommunities.com, you can see, you can sign up for the course there. You can also download, I have nine... Um, files, PDF files, which is the course material, so you can read through that, which is like an excerpt from the upcoming book. And then stay tuned, hopefully I get this book done by the end of the month, and that will give you all the information you need. There's uh, so much to take away from that. By the way, I like your, on, on your website, formingcommunities.com, you have a one-year uh, survival calendar. What is that about? Well, that was something... Um, you know, people have problems prepping, especially uh, nowadays. A, a lot of people are waking up these days. Yes. The um, the phony medical emergency, the completely artificial created medical emergency that's used to justify the absolute enslavement of humanity um, has woken a lot of people up. And now they're getting desperate. They're starting to worry, well, wait a minute things are going bad. Maybe I need to be one of those conspiracy theorists, one of those crazy preppers. And I don't like the term prepper myself. I prefer to say survivalist. But anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, and now they're starting to get into survival. So what I've done is I've tried to make it easy. The whole 12-year um, survival calendar will be in the book, that uh, the, the Complete Guide to Forming Communities. It's at the end of the book where I talk about survival communities. And I just laid it all out. What's the, the simplest, from easy to more complex, from cheap to more expensive? Where do we start in getting prepared for what's coming? So the first thing is a, a three-day kit, you know, three days worth of food, three days worth of medicine, you know, alternative ways of a, a walkie-talkie, an emergency radio. 
and then it gets more complicated. Each month, you add to your preps. So you don't have to do everything at once. Um, every month, you add a little bit more, add a little bit more, get some more skills. Also, the things that you need to learn, like, you know, for the first month, take, in the f take a first aid course. Everyone should take a first aid course. Uh, in the sixth month, uh, get, get your hunting license. You know, get your firearm license, get a firearm, um, and so on. So I make it very easy. Start from the simple and cheap and go to the complex and m increasingly more expensive. You know, in the beginning, you should have a first aid kit. But after one year, you might need to set up your own MASH uh, unit and have your own electronic defibrillator, maybe an ultrasound machine, you know, 300 bucks. But if you're going to set up an emergency medical uh, community, then an ultrasound machine will come in really handy for diagnosing fractures and gunshot wounds and things like that. So, you know, uh, we start easy and cheap, but and then we move to more complex uh, until you're finally, after one year, my hope, if you follow the calendar, is that you're completely self-sufficient indefinitely, which means you set up your gardens, you set up your chicken coops, you're raising a, um, maybe a couple of pigs, maybe some goats, maybe some rabbits. You've got your own mash tent, your portable hospital. Maybe you've rented a room at uh, one of the local storefronts and you use that as a medical clinic. You hire your own doctor to come in and look after members of your community. Maybe even open the doors to people that from the outside that, you know, they don't have medical help let them barter for, for some attention, some medical attention, um, things like that, so that you're completely, oh, and then set up your own communications team, um, you know, get a ham radio, get a base station. Here where I'm working with my community, everybody's got a ham radio, and we have overlapping fields of transmission. The small radios that everybody has is good for 15, 20 kilometers, but since everybody lives within 15 to 20 kilometers, we overlap the transmissions, and now we can communicate from one county to another by hopscotching from one radio owner to the next. We right, pass frequency hopping, right? Huh? Frequency hopping. Exactly. Yes, so sir. It's like a, 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 a like a, a broken telephone. We, you know, send out a message to one, and they pass that on to another, and everybody picks up on it, and they repeat that message until. Everybody in the whole county now knows what's going on. So we need to do that now, folks. Once, once the uh, SHT hits the fan, um, you won't have time to do this because you will be in chaos. You'll be running around like a chicken with your head cut off unless you have already planned for it. And really important is you've got to think about this and make plans. What's your rendezvous location? What's your retreat location? What would you do if you can't get water anymore? How much food do you have stockpiled? How will you communicate to your neighbors 10 kilometers away? You know, we've got to plan this now. We've got to set it up now. Okay, you don't, you know, it's not panic mode yet. Not panic mode yet. When it all collapses, you will hit panic mode unless you already have your plans. Like for me and the people I know, we can sit back and relax now, George. Um, you know, whatever comes, whether it's, you know, a nuclear attack on New York City or the Great Famine or a real pandemic, whatever it is, we've got plans. We know how to deal with it. We might not have everything we want or everything we need. Um, you know, I, I would love to have a hollowed out volcano as my base. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. That would be nice. But I don't have that. So what I have is an apartment, and I have my stockpiles of food and my communications. I have a good medical kit. I have extra medicines. And I have ways and means of uh, resupplying all of that when the time comes. So you got to make the plans. you got to think about that. My books will help. My online uh, course on how to create communities will get you started because you know the other thing too is that's why I wrote the book is people don't have those skills anymore George you know it we we live in a different world than our great grandparents our great grandparents knew all their neighbors they knew the local farmers 
by, on a first name basis, you know. Here, we don't even know the next door neighbor. We don't know what their name is. We don't talk to them. How are we going to form a community? Also, they don't teach those skills in school. The last thing the government wants is for you to organize to be self-sufficient. <laughs> you know, they, they depend on you, or they count on you being dependent on the government to be helpless weaklings begging the government for help at every turn. That's what the, the powers that be want and that's what they've promoted and as a result people don't know how to work together. How do you form a community? How do you organize meetings? What's a charter? What kind of legal structure do you need to do? How do you organize uh, meetings and get together? Um, what would be the bylaws and rules and regulations and the contracts and how would you, you know, what's the priorities? People don't know this stuff. I know they don't know it. And so the only hope we have of getting people organized is to give them that information, which is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you people everything they need. It's in the book, the charters, the legal forms, the applications, the uh, um, medical forms that you need to fill out just to become a member of the community. And because, you know, if you're going to join my community, I need to know if you have a heart condition so I can prepare for you. If you have a heart attack, do we have a, a defibrillator somewhere close by handy that we can treat you? That's all part of the community. That's what the community has to do, support each other. So that's what I've been trying to do with the, uh, with the course, with the book. Gives you everything you need to do. You don't have to research it. It's right there. And uh, it's, when you get the book in a PDF download, you go to the end, there's appendixes for everything. Just print them out. Print them out, fill in your own uh, uh, header, your own logo, your own uh, group name. Done. It's all there. How to incorporate. Non-profit, for-profit, uh, uh, private member association. Whatever you want to do, I've laid it all out. I'm trying to do the best I can, George, to make it as simple and easy for people to form communities because... Here's what happens, and this is what has happened in history. The society will collapse. There will be chaos. Warlords, crime, feudal system. Typically a feudal system is installed. Local militias, usually police and military, they're gonna be your biggest enemy. Um, will form you know, criminal gangs that will run the world. And things will be chaos, all right? There'll be a lot of death and destruction but then what happens after that, from this chaos, seeds will grow that will create a new society. Because after the stage of chaos, the next stage is the stage or the era of warriors. This is what they call it. The era or the stage of warriors. And the warrior stage is a golden age in civilization. This is where we rebuild. We start again from scratch. But this time we do it with people that have been working together in small communities. So most important, you, your family, your extended family, your neighbors, you must survive. And then once all is said and done, you will rise up and you will connect with similar communities in your county, in your state, and eventually across the country. We will all join forces after a few years and build a new society. By this time, all the psychopaths will have been murdered off anyways. So we have a chance. So if you can survive the next 10 years, you will live to see a golden age but you won't live to see a golden age unless you're prepared, unless you're strong and courageous, and unless you work together. Hence the term, only the strong survive. It's uh, the bottom of the hour. It's uh, You're listening live to the Fact Hunters radio broadcast uh, on this July 18th, 2022, with our very special guest, uh, Stefan Verstappen uh, of Chinastrategies.com and FormingCommunities.com couple takeaways from what you were just talking about. It is very important to make sure within your community that you identify everyone's skills in the uh, SH 
uh, TF type of moment, right? My wife's a nurse, so maybe she'll take care of on the medical side. Uh, I'm, I'm a carpenter slash stonemason. Um, maybe the guy down the street's a plumber. You know, it, it's amazing when you come together as a community and you take everybody's skills, how strong you, you, you can actually be. The problem is, like you said, I know when I was growing up, I knew everybody on my street, every single person. And if my mom needed a cup of sugar, we didn't run to the store. I walked next door with a little cup and she filled it up and went back to my mom and vice versa. Um, but really in 2022, most people don't even know who lives right next to them. Yes. And what you said uh, is very important too. And that's why, again, as part of the book, um, what I've done is I've divided survival skills into five categories nourishment shelter medical communications and security now everybody has a role to play within the community and again i'm doing everything i can george to make it easy i've even created a um oh a 75 question self-assessment test and it's uh, a survey of your skills it, it, it's not a pass or fail test it's simply questions that will help you define what area you're best at and so it's a bunch of skills that are uh, that you you know you provide an answer to what you know do you have a um, have you worked as a nurse yes no you know do you have a first aid uh, certificate yes no um, do you know about home nursing uh, do you know about medicinal herbs um, and so on. So there's like 25 questions each, each test, and you can fill it out, and then find out what areas, what talents and skills you have. And so I would recommend I'm doing that with my community here. Everybody fills out their self-assessment, their skills assessment test, and that will give everybody a good idea of what they, you know, who in their community uh, has what skills. So your wife is a nurse. So obviously she would be, you know, ideal for the medical team. And then people that are in the community, they call and say, listen, you know, my kids are sick. Uh, we can't get to a hospital. We can't get to a doctor. Can your wife come over and take a look? Yes, that's what the community is about. But in addition, your wife might fit best in the medical community, but also she's a great gardener. So then she would also be an asset to the nutrition community. So when she's not dispensing medical advice or checking in on members of the community to see how they're doing health-wise, she can also help out in the, in the garden. That's a good point. And one thing we need to remember, once you get to a, com like you said, you're at a comfortable level uh, of prepping, you feel like you, you, know, you guys have done everything you need to be ready. Uh, one thing that is very important, even once you get to that point, you have to uh, continuously rehearse, right? Have your drills, but also uh, say, for instance, with your, your food and substance, make sure you have uh, check the expiration dates and things of that nature, rotate your stock, etc. Absolutely, and that's part of the nutrition team is to check the expiration dates and to make sure to, you know, keep a, a, an inventory of what we have. Now, I recommend everybody personally have one year supply of food. That's a lot of food. That um, <clears throat> It's a lot of food for me. I'm only one person, and so I'm just doing an inventory now. I got my entire living room filled with cans and, you know, 100 pounds of rice and all that. I'm doing an inventory. God forbid how much food you would need to supply for a family of five. It's a lot. It's it's a huge amount. But try and get to that goal. Try and get to the goal of being, you know, having enough food for one year. We see what's happening now with the crops and uh, you know they're destroying the farms they're destroying the farmers they're destroying uh you know lines of distribution uh, i you know so uh this time next year the crops might not be very good and you'll again be reliant on your own store piles but i also recommend then as a community you also store food so if you're going to for example if you're going to charge members of your community and I know a lot of people say, oh, we don't want to charge, you know, to be a part of the group. Well, you know, you have to charge to be part of the group. I don't care if it's 10 bucks a month, if it's 20 bucks a month. Your great-grandparents paid one day's wages per year 
and that supplied them with all the medical care and emergency funds and business loans and scholarships and unemployment insurance and retirement funds and burial insurance one day wages a year that's what communities can do the the money grows exponential and you can do a lot with it so if you do charge I would recommend 100 bucks a month what's that it's for your life and that 100 bucks a month will go to buy the materials that you will need as a community. So you will buy extra medicine. You'll buy a, an ultrasound machine and IV bags and extra uh, surgical kits and a, an electronic defibrillator. And then, you know, you also can use that to buy a ham radio home base, 50 watts, get a big antenna. That can be the home base. You know, you've got probably a 50-mile range with that. And then link that up to all the individual radios of different members. Um, you can cover your entire county. Now you've got communications. Now you know what's going on. Uh, and especially important when you don't have the Internet. But again, that base station, you know, it's, it's 1500 bucks. you know. An individual member might not have the money to pay for that. But as a community, everybody chipping in and saying, yeah, no, it's a worthwhile acquisition to have, then let's do that. Same thing with a generator. I can't afford a $2,000 gas generator right now. Um, I can't. So, But as a community, uh, again, you pool your money and you say, listen, we're, let's get a generator. We'll store it at the shed over at Bob's farm. And then everybody that needs to come and recharge their batteries, recharge their laptop, recharge their... Uh, uh, the radios, well, you know, go over to uh, uh, Bob's uh, garage uh, or shed and uh, we'll run the generator, recharge everybody's equipment. And, and again, as a community, you might be better able to afford a $2,000 generator. The other thing, too, is to stockpile food for the community. Number one, seeds and fertilizer. Now, the community here where I am, everybody's doing a great job. They've got gardens, they've got greenhouses, people pitch in to look after the gardens, to water it, to weed it, to plant the seeds, and then eventually to harvest it. This is what we need to do. So then, but maybe we need to invest money in a rototiller. I can't afford 800 bucks for a rototiller. It wouldn't make any sense for me to buy one anyways. I don't have a garden big enough to merit it. But let's say I want to do a quarter acre. We get a quarter acre, you, we, we you know, we get it free from one of the members of the community that has, you know, two or three acre property outside of town. Quarter acre is nothing for them. They donate the use in exchange for some of the produce that we produce. Now, to till a quarter acre, yeah, it's worthwhile to buy a rototiller. And again, as a community, you're better able to afford that than as an individual. So again, you know, chipping in a monthly fee so that you can afford to buy the tools you need to become self-sustainable as a community not as an individual as an individual get your one year supply of food great but that food will run out as we've seen in Venezuela and, and, and Bosnia even the preppers there they had a year supply two year supply of food year three they were starving because they had no way of uh, replenishing their food supplies. So as a community, we need to work on replenishing food supplies. So do we need to spend 2,000 bucks for lumber and glass to build a greenhouse? Okay, as a community, it's worth it. And then also finally, stockpile some long-term preserves. Um, we also have, um, you know, we're in Mennonite country, an Amish country, and one of the Mennonite families runs an industrial kitchen where they do canning. So at the end of the season, we're going to take a percentage of the produce and we're going to can it for long-term storage. So again, as a community, we can work together. We can, we can um, buy the jars, we can buy the cans, we can buy the produce, we can buy the meat, we can can it, and then store that you know, in, in the lodge house or the, the clubhouse or you know, we can rent a shed on somebody's property and we store food there as well. Plus, seeds. We need to stockpile seeds so that each year we can grow a new garden. 
So this is again all part of being belonging to a community and looking for long-term survival and self-sufficiency. Yeah, if you have Amish friends in your neck of the woods or Mennonites, I implore you guys to make friends with them because guess what? They operate without electricity already. So if things go sideways, they're still going to continue their day-to-day -day operations. We use uh, one of our friends. He's our butcher. So when we, we've done raised our chickens, we take them down there for four bucks a head. Uh, he does everything for us. Uh, the cheap. other thing that you mentioned, on the front side of a financial collapse or natural disaster, uh, fiat currency, uh, you know, it's important to have money in order to buy things, you know, my wife and I has invested uh, into a lot of seeds. We have a seed vault, <laughs> like nice. serious. Um, but post collapse, if you remember back in March, the, the, the pictures of all, all the Venezuelan money in the streets, people just threw the money. It was worthless. You had to take a bag of cash if you wanted to buy a loaf of bread, but legitimately. Yeah. So what things do you see as being a commodity uh, post collapse? The things you can barter with in order to get things to to get by well there's a lot of different ways that we can barter i'm going to go for something that i know a community in arizona is doing and that is they're issuing their own money and it's based on man hours and it's traded within the community this is done before you know at one time uh, not too long ago um, every county had their own bank and their own currency you know if you lived in oklahoma and, and uh 1820, Oklahoma had their own money. <laughs> it was only good within Oklahoma or Kansas or Missouri. Uh, you couldn't spend it in California. But they issued money. The, the local banks issued their own money for their own citizens. Um, you know, long before the central bank and the greenback and the dollar and all that, this is what communities have done. Same thing throughout Europe in ancient times you know the local king would mint their own silver coins and uh, because it was silver it was then you know interchangeable throughout the uh, throughout the world silver is silver but uh, so this community in Arizona they're issuing their own script and it's based on man hours now the only value in this world is labor it's what people spend their time and labor and effort to produce that is the only thing of value. That's why we are all enslaved in this debt system. We work, they give us paper, and uh, they get all the value. So we can issue our own script, one example, and it's based on man hours. So this dollar, if you want to call it a dollar, is worth one hour of labor. And so we can exchange it. So I'll work an hour on your garden and then... Uh, and you can come and work an hour getting my tractor going because you're a mechanic or because you're a carpenter um, here's you know here's ten dollars come and put in ten hours building my greenhouse and uh, I'll, I'll put in ten hours helping you with uh, uh, with your communications and, and training your people and you know however it is that's one form of barter there are many things that we can barter. I'll give you another example that I'm doing myself. So I bought rice in bulk. I bought four 25-pound sacks of rice. Now I divided all that 100 pounds of rice into mylar bags with oxygen absorbers. So that will pretty much ensure that that bag of rice will last 10, 15 years. Easy. And I put them in two pound bags. So now I've got a two pound bag of rice that's good for 10, 15 years. It's all sealed in mylar bags. What a great barter item. That, ten, that, that two pound bags of rice will provide you with 20 meals. So now I can barter that bag of rice with the local farmer and uh, he can supply me with you know half a dozen potatoes or some cabbages or some eggs. So that's another way of bargaining thing or, or, or bargaining. I also, you know, bought a whole lot of ground coffee and I divided them up into one pound bags. Again, sealed in mylar with oxygen absorbers so that again, that coffee is good for 10, 15 years and it's a pretty handy little package, you know. It's not bulky and um, so uh, who wants coffee? Well, I got coffee. I got sugar packed in mylar bags, you know. One pound bag of sugar, one pound bag of salt, one pound bags of... Um, 
uh, uh, powdered milk. These things are great barter items because it's nutritious. People need it. It's sealed. It's good for a long time. It's uh, uh, it will last you ten years, and I and people know what they're getting. Yeah, yeah. I would like twenty meals. I would like twenty helpings of rice. To me, that's worth you know a dozen chicken eggs or or a couple of chickens. Those are barter items. The other thing, of course, is the more traditional barter items, which would be ammunition. Um, the the uh, the fellow that did the blog about surviving a year in hell who lived through the Bosnian crisis, he said that ammunition was the number one trade item. Well, actually, he said Bic lighters were the number one trade item. Yeah, uh, Bic lighters were more important than anything else. But second was ammunition. He said he traded ammunition for food, and then he traded food for ammunition. It went back and forth, so that's a great barter item. You know, uh, 10 shotgun shells, yeah, it yeah, should be worth a chicken. Um, then also what I have is, uh, you know, I've got like 20 bottles of vodka. Now, I don't drink vodka. I drink beer. Um, but, and I, uh, they're 12-ounce bottles, so they're Mickey's, what we call here in Canada, Mickey. And so they're small bottles of vodka, easy to slip into your pocket. And uh, during the end times, everybody wants a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Even people that don't drink, you know, at the, de at the end of a... A rough day of uh, foraging and defending yourself against marauders, and you're finally settling in for the night. Who would like a shot of vodka? All hands will go up, trust me. And so, vodka is a good, um, or any other kind of liquor, but vodka is kind of universal, you know, um, is a good barter item. Now, to replenish my stock of vodka, I also bought a distiller. So now I can make my own moonshine. So. If I trade 10 shotgun rounds for 20 pounds of potatoes, I can take those 20 pounds of potatoes and I can make 12 uh, uh, bottles of vodka from that um, using my distiller. You know, so it all works together and uh, it, it's integrated so that you're always replenishing your stock. You're, you have a way of replenishing because you can't stockpile enough to last 10 years. You can't. Um, and we might have to live through this for 10 years. So you need to always think, okay, once I run out, what do I do to get more? Uh, so again, I can barter with the bottles of vodka, and I can barter with my sacks of rice, my nice tidy packages of long-term storable rice. Uh, the other thing I have is, um, then finally, I do have some gold and silver. I have uh, silver ounces, and I have some gold and and small 5 gram, 2.5 gram uh, bullion. And that is like my last resort. If things get really bad, gold and silver is what I'll spend. But that's for something like, you know, let's say I got to go to the next county. I got to go there and pick up a pig and three chickens. But there is a checkpoint. The local police department who's morphed into a warlord society and that's what happens you know that's why the Chinese don't trust the police because China has a long history of corrupt police forces turning into local warlords and but I have to get across the border there and um, well you know a couple of ounces of silver maybe five ten grams of gold to look the other way while I go and get the pigs and the chickens that's maybe that's what you'll have to do or Let's say you need seriously to get some antibiotics. You know, your kids have a bronchial pneumonia, and uh, the only thing that's going to help them is antibiotics. But of course, the hospitals are gone, the doctors are gone. Um, we do have a medical team that does a lot of herbal medicine, and they have medical or herbal equivalents to antibiotics. But just between you and me, um, Pharmacy antibiotics, amoxicillin, penicillin, tetracycline. Um, these are powerful drugs, and sometimes you need a really powerful drug to um, cure the bronchial pneumonia. So your 12-year-old daughter is dying. I got to get antibiotics. Now we have to go to the black market, and maybe the black market's not interested in your shotgun shells. They got enough, or they're not interested in your vodka because they already got a ton of vodka. Silver and gold 
is the final barter item that I'd be willing to risk for life-saving medicine and life-saving food. Everything's on point there. One thing I'd like to add to that, uh, you brought up Bosnia. I was there, I was in Sarajevo 22, 23 years ago, and what you said is accurate. I think the war ended right around the end of 1995, and the folks there who I talked to said it was a couple years before things even got back to any type of semi-normal life because... You just don't all of a sudden, after you know that entire town, I'm talking every building, when you cross uh, in, from Croatia into uh, Bosnia, there wasn't a building that didn't have a bullet hole in it. Um, and it took time to get everything, the crops and everything. I think most people said two to three years before um, people w weren't struggling to, to find food. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah. No, that that is a really great case example. I've, I've read as much as I could on, on the, the Bosnian crisis there. It's interesting that you were there, George. So you've seen it firsthand. You yes. know what happens when, when civilizations collapse. It's chaos, you know. And I remember reading, they said that even, you know, the, the off-grid farmers out in the countryside, you know, they, they, had, they were hit hardest. Um, so if you think that, oh, you know, we've got to get out of the city. Yeah, it, it's better outside the city than inside the city but it doesn't mean you're safe outside the city. And from what I've read, they said that um, the, the small towns and villages in the countryside, they were hit hardest because they were hit by militias. You have, you know, 20 guys come in there with, with uh, 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 fully armed. They take over the whole small town, they loot it top to bottom, and then they leave and everybody left has got nothing, nothing left. So, you know, that's why we need security, that's why we need communications, communications so that we know when they're coming, security that can set up roadblocks and ambushes and evacuate the people and, and hide your food, hide your barter items, hide your children, hide your dogs and your cats because they'll come and kill them and eat them. That's what they did in Venezuela. You know, people are eating their pets there. You know, th this is how bad things can get. I don't know if it's going to get that bad here, but I, you know, I'm not hoping for the best, to be honest with you. We, we have a very selfish, very ignorant society as a whole. I don't, uh, you know, back in the 1930s, um, people were different. They had more integrity, if I may say so. Um, and they didn't go complete Mad Max just because things got rough. Now, I wouldn't put it past everybody to completely lose it, go Mad Max, go lunatic. You know, when they're hungry, then you don't know what people do. I've seen this myself. You know, you meet guys, you think, oh, he's a pretty good guy, he's got it together. Now. You put that person in an emergency situation, and then you watch how they break down into a sniveling lunatic you don't know who, who's going to be affected by this. You don't know who's going to be able to hold it together. It's a very th weird thing, George. You can't tell on the surface who will hold it together and who is going to lose their stuff. I saw this, you know, as a first responder, you know. There are guys that, uh, you know, they're tough guys and all that. Oh, my God, you know, and then they see uh, an open fracture and a, and a, and a, a spurting arterial wound and they throw up and they lose it and they curl up in a fetal position under the desk. Yeah. You don't know who's going to act like that. Same thing when the, when, when the famine starts and the shooting starts and the looting starts. Um, you don't know who's just going to completely lose their shit. And you can't, you know, so uh, will it happen that bad here as it did there in Bosnia, as it did in Venezuela? My guess would be yes, yes. So. I think it depends on just how bad the food situation gets. That's the biggest part. And listen, when you get hit, if you get robbed, uh, you know, it sucks. But in, in, in a normal situation, things can be replaced. But when there's already a shortage and, and people will start coming, like I, I'm, I live out in the, in the rural area. I'm, I'm out in the country. It, it's only a matter of time when, you know, <laughs> things run out in the cities. People will start making their way out to the country because they know that's where the eggs and the chickens and the pigs and the cows uh, and those type of things. So it doesn't really matter where you live. When thing, if things go, and I don't, I'm not 
convinced they're going to go completely sideways here. I don't, I don't know. I, I hope not. However, I will tell you, and by the way, we only have about 30 seconds until the break. Uh, I follow a lot of preppers on YouTube. Uh, I have never seen so many people break down in tears in front of a camera. Uh, people have lost uh, their entire crops this year. Specifically, I think in the in the Midwest, they have yeah. gone just record droughts this year. Yeah. People have lost their entire crops. Uh, I watched a 72-year-old man this weekend break down in tears. All his wheat is gone. And yeah. he used that wheat to feed all of his livestock through the entire winter. So he has no idea how he's going to feed his stock. We go here to the auction every Wednesday night. We went last week. Uh, there was more sellers than buyers. And half of the livestock looked like their ribs were sticking out. They were all malnourished. Oh, oh. It was really, my wife and I left. We were so upset. It's just a sign of the times. Uh, we're go about to go to break. Hour number two with uh, Stefan Verstappen. We're going to talk more about, I want to talk about your Paradise Stolen series, uh, Master's Guide uh, to the Way of the Warrior. I've got a couple other questions. Uh, and at the bottom of hour number two, I certainly want to open up the phone lines if anybody have any questions uh, for Mr. Verstappen uh, and anything to do in the entire realm of uh, prepping or survival skills. Uh, he'd be more than welcome to take your calls. You're listening to the Fact Hunters Radio Broadcast for Monday, July 18th, 2022. Don't touch that dial. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. All right, everybody, we're back for hour number two of the Fact Hunter Radio Broadcast on this beautiful Monday, July 18th, 2022. Uh, and we're entering hour two with a good friend, Stefan Verstappen. Um, I had a question for you, Stefan. We had, uh, for, you've been to China. You spent a lot of time in Asia. What's the difference between the China that they put on the mainstream media, which, you know, we don't believe <laughs> anything they say, versus the China that you experienced firsthand? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, there are two types of China. One is the Chinese people that live in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. And I've lived in Hong Kong and I lived in Taiwan. And uh, I really like those Chinese people. They're, they're good people. Um, then there's the Chinese that have been under the yoke of 80 years of communism. Now, <clears throat> that's mainland China. And those people are horrible people. I, you, know, I'm, you know, there are some good ones, but what people don't understand is that communism is evil incarnate. Communism will suck the soul out of everybody that lives under it. They will destroy virtue. They will destroy your family. They will destroy any kind of honesty and cooperation. Look around us. We're all subject to communist tyranny right now. Canada is a communist country. America is a communist country. It is, you know, because communism is when the government controls just about everything you think and do. And, you know, you need a permit and a license and tax to take a piss. That's communism. But mainland China has lived under 80 years of this stuff. They have no soul left. They're cruel and selfish and corrupt to the core. And the communist regime in China is evil incarnate. These people are monsters. They have death camps. They have concentration camps. Everybody's monitored and watched. And, and uh, you, you know, nobody can do anything in China without the government uh, overseeing it. And... You know, their, their treatment of animals, I, I, you know, because I love animals. And it, it hurts me that we have to eat beef and pigs, but so long as they have a quick and painless death, I'm, you know, okay, I have to live with it. That's, right. that's nature. Nature is cruel anyways. So, so, you know, at, at the very least, let's not inflict more cruelty. But the Chinese people, oh, my God. The, and, and their country is a disaster. Every river, every lake is polluted. It's toxic. You can't swim in them. God forbid you should drink the water. It's full of heavy metals and mercury and God knows how many chemicals. It's disgusting. The ground soil is polluted. The air is polluted. Now, here in Canada, you know, uh, we have to pay through the nose for carbon tax. Meanwhile, in China, I mean, the place is a toxic waste dump. Their economy is a sham. It's a complete hoax. You know, they build buildings, and the, because of the corruption, the, the building materials, they lose. I mean, they, they, they pour concrete on a sand base. They don't even put in foundations. 
and lo and behold a 60-story building after a year tips over and falls over they call them tofu buildings because they're so poorly constructed they crumble before people even have a chance to move into it I mean it's a complete disaster from top to bottom mainland China communist China is evil beyond comprehension they do live organ transplants they kidnap people on the streets they cut their organs out without anesthesia and they sell them on the black market mostly to Israel and you know it's 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 horrendous so I advise everybody to boycott China uh, which is hard to do because now we've sent them all our manufacturing I was there in 2000 I saw it with my own eyes I couldn't believe it I'm going well why is GM opening a plant here and closing a plant in Canada you know don't we need the jobs why is IBM opening a plant here and closing a plant in the United States why is Apple building their phones here instead of building the phones in the United States don't we need the jobs? Don't we need the income? Doesn't the local economy need uh, the tax money that those corporations would pay? But no, we've sent it all over to China. It's all part of the plan to destroy Western civilizations. We don't even manufacture our own goods. But under the communist regime, all those materials and all, all the manufactured goods, it's garbage. Tell me something, you know... I, 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 I don't know what to say anymore. Whatever you buy from China lasts two weeks, and then it's broken. It stops working. What the hell good is that? Even if you say, oh, well, it's a, it's a $30 TV. Maybe I should buy a $600 TV. That will still break down in two weeks anyways because of the corruption. And, and you know, they, they do it on purpose. So we've moved all our manufacturing over to China. But they can't manufacture anything of quality, nothing. So all this crap that we get back, we sacrificed our jobs, our livelihoods, our incomes to give it to China, and they've sold us back our own stuff, but it's garbage. So, no, don't get me started on mainland China. It's evil. I mean, you know, uh, you know instead of invading m the Middle East, we should invade China, if you ask me, because the Chinese people themselves suffer horrendously under the communists I, and but they have no hope of rising up and usurping their government no hope there's none yeah they're very strong-handed over there it, it's it's amazing i'll tell you one of the big nails in the coffin here in the united states and i'm sure in canada as well is what you just mentioned when, when they took the manufacturers and the factories away from the towns that was such a dagger I remember growing up, everybody here in Delaware either worked at DuPont or uh, we had a GM plant, maybe five miles from where I lived. And probably, a, you know, a third of, of our surrounding towns depended on that that plant. And in the 80s, it went away. It went to, I think, Mexico. And, and you've seen it. And then NAFTA in the 90s decimated a lot of our, you know, economies here in the States. Uh, it's once again the globalists selling us out. Uh, all in the name of the mighty buck and I'm, I'm just telling you when we gave up manufacturing that was just a, a nail in the coffin what is your take do you think China in the near future is going to take Taiwan um, well listen this is what's happening you know uh, mainland China is a disaster they are already um, starting to protest pretty violently now last time there was a a, a serious protest in mainland China was the Tiananmen Square protest. This was back in 1990 something. I was, no, 1980 something. I was living in Taiwan at the time. We watched it live on uh, local TV in Taiwan. And years later, when I was in Beijing and uh, I went to Tiananmen Square, and we talked to the locals and we asked them about, you know, what was it like? Were you here during the Tiananmen Square? We have no idea how many people they murdered. Thousands. They said, you know, after a couple of days, they had to bring in bulldozers to scrape up the two feet thick layer of coagulated blood in the square. So that's how, uh, that's how the communists deal with protests. They will run you over with tanks. That's what they did. They sent the tanks in. They opened up the machine guns, and if you weren't lucky enough to be murdered by a, a machine gun bullet, then the tank would roll over you and crush you in the streets. This is what the communists do. Oh my God, you know, and then you, 
and then I have to sit here and, and watch all these stupid SJWs running around with the, with the uh, sickle, hammer and sickle, and all claim to be communists. You lunatics. You have no idea what communism is. You have no idea the effects of communism on a country. It's blood and death and misery. So, yeah, um, did that answer your question? I forgot what the question was. <laughs> I'm just thought, do, do, do you see that China physically taking Taiwan oh, in the near yeah, future? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, so what happens is, okay, now, listen, they got to distract from their internal problems, and this is what every country has done. Yep. When the internal problems get to be so much that uh, they don't think they can deal with it anymore. Now, well, look, that's what happens here, too, like, with this whole Ukraine and Russia. What the... Uh, it's very hard for me not to swear. What the hell is Biden doing sending $40 billion, $60 billion to the Ukraine? What? What? There aren't homeless people in America. There aren't businesses being destroyed in America that it could use, you know, a $50,000 interest-free loan. You know, no, we have to send it to the Ukraine to fight the Russians. Why? Because they want to get us involved in a war in, in, in Russia. Why? So we, you know, are distracted from the high inflation and you know, from the unemployment and, and from, you know, the, the complete lack of health care. Countries always do that. So I, I fear for Taiwan. I love Taiwan. Uh, I had a very good time there. I love the Taiwanese people. Taiwan is going to be a tough nut to crack because they are heavily entrenched in there. I'm not kidding. They are, you know, twice a year they would have a military drill. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. They would, uh, all the sirens, the air raid sirens would go off, you know, just like you see in the movies. Woo -hoo -hoo. And uh, once a year, then that means everybody has to stop what they're doing for two minutes. So if you're driving your car, you hear the air raid siren, you pull over to the side of the road and you stop. Everybody stopped for two minutes. Now, the second time they have their drill, I saw it for myself. Unbelievable. Um, the roofs of apartment buildings surrounding the airport, what you thought was an elevator uh, motor housing, a shaft, you know, the little boxes on top of the... They would open up and it would reveal anti-aircraft missile installations. And the, the turnarounds, the... the you know the circles, the turnarounds where they usually have like a, a raised bed garden in the middle. Of the the ports would open up, machine guns would poke out. They're all connected by subterranean tunnels. Um, apartment buildings, the garage door would open. Suddenly, 15 tanks would roll out. I mean, they are heavily armed. So if China does attack Taiwan, it will be a bloodbath. But that's what they want. That's what they want. So I wouldn't doubt that China would attack Taiwan. I wouldn't doubt that China would attack the United States. Um, you know, here in Canada, they did something very ominous. Our glorious leader, Adolf Castro, uh, allows, made, signed an agreement to allow the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military, to guard their own property here in Canada. Now, why would the Chinese need to send their military to guard their business investments in Canada? Why? Because Canada is such a lawless country? Uh, I mean, do, does the Canadian Army send military to China to guard Tim Hortons <laughs> donut shops? <laughs> of course not. But what I think is really happening is that China already has probably several mechanized divisions already stationed in the West Coast. Look at all the uh, um, the shipping containers that come in. Do you think they're all inspected? Do you think no. everybody looks into them? They all come from China, thousands of them a year. Each one of them could easily hold one or two tanks, maybe a couple of helicopters, partially dissembled, you know, anti-aircraft installation, hundreds of troops already here. We already have millions of Chinese immigrants in Canada. How many of them are uh, a, a Chinese military? and they have their own warehouses so they could smuggle all the guns and ammunition and the tanks and the helicopters and the anti-aircraft guns and missile batteries they could smuggle all that in no problem you know they go to the, the port authority there hey guys here's ten thousand bucks see these ten containers 
don't bother looking into them. They're going straight to the warehouse. And then the warehouse is surrounded by barbed wire and surveillance camera and Chinese military. Not even the local Canadian police or the local Canadian military is allowed into that area to see what they're up to. So they can assemble their helicopters, they can put together the, you know, they can house thousands of, of troops. To me, that's what they're doing. That's what I would do. You know, I, my first book was on strategy and tactics. I studied a lot of military uh, warfare, strategy, tactics. I'm a contributor to uh, another writer, H.M. Uh, Poole, who is a, uh, a former Marine major who writes books on small military tactics, anti-guerrilla, insurgency tactics. I contributed to his books. So I have a fairly good idea of how military strategy works. And if I wanted to take over the U.S., that's what I would do. So would it surprise me that China already has 30,000 troops, fully mechanized helicopters, attack helicopters, jets? They could uh, bring in their own jets. They all assemble them in the warehouse. Um, they could already be here. And who's going to stop them? The drag queen story hour folks <laughs> who's going to stop them there who's going well, to you know don't th underestimate those big orange wings Stefan. yeah there in san francisco would be nothing you know the military here in the united states has already been decimated you know yeah. um you know wh what the navy in the high heel shoes are going to rush out and say it'd be nothing you set off an emp uh near the major uh military bases you know like uh seal beach in california and uh the Presidio in San Francisco and so on, uh, take out their communications. And the Chinese also have thousands of shipping vessels, fishing vessels, that are secretly military vessels. They've got thousands of them, so they could easily send 100,000 troops over and then being attacked from behind by the troops that are already stationed here. Would it surprise me if China takes over the entire west coast of the United States? No, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, they've certainly done an, uh, an outstanding job weakening the west coast from uh, Seattle, Portland, and you know a lot of California. One thing is for sure, I will tell you 100%, the Canadian Army uh, War College that you know trains the, the top military minds in Canada, uh, they take the top brass of the Canadian, I'm sorry, the Chinese army, and they train them there. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Canadian, you know, war college are training uh, the Chinese generals and, you know, colonels. It's just a travesty. And then there were some reports earlier this year that there was some Chinese drills going, you know, uh, air drills going on north of Michigan. I don't know if you remember hearing about yes. that. Yes, yes. Sure, they were, they were training them here and uh, with the blessings of the Canadian government and also the Chinese espionage system has infiltrated all levels of Canadian and U.S. government. Was it, who was that crazy lunatic uh, congresswoman there with her chauffeur turned out to be? A, uh, oh, the whole Fang Fang incident? Not Pelosi. Uh, what was that other lunatic woman there that... Uh, 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 there's a long line of them. Anyway, she was a <laughs> horrible human being. Well, listen, the Chinese military knows everything about U.S. military and the Canadian military. Our defense plans, our defense structures, our uh, uh, mobility, our uh, logistics, our strength, our weaknesses, they know all of it already. So it would be nothing for them to take over. I mean, I'm surprised they haven't done it already. It's right there. It's it would hardly be an effort on the part of the Chinese to take over the entire West Coast from uh, California, Nevada, all the way up to Washington State, of course, Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, in a thousand miles all the way to maybe to Wyoming. You know, they could take it all over in a week if they wanted to. Now, when things get bad enough in China and they're starving because their own food production has gone through the toilet, and they're starving, and, and uh, now their banks have stopped paying out uh, uh, any money. The, there's a big run on the banks there. 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Chinese cannot pay their bills because the banks stopped operating. That's leading to these mass protests there in China. Um, what's going to happen then? They can't feed themselves and they're going to go crazy. And, uh, well, what would be easy then to take over the West Coast, steal what they can here, and um, and again, that would distract. Because when a country goes at war, then for some weird-ass reason, everybody automatically rallies around the current leadership. Exactly. If China invades us, it's going to be for a reason, and it'll be under the guidance of the global, you know, the, the true global leaders. Yes, the true the global leaders. Yeah, because first of all, don't think for a moment that the Chinese Communist Party is controlled by Chinese. Of it's controlled not. by the New York bankers. That's right. And the New World Order. That's who runs it. That's who's run China for the last 200 years. I, I, I know a lot about Chinese history. It goes way back, you know, even before the Opium Wars where uh, the British East India Company opened fire on Chinese cities to force them to accept opium to contribute to the mass addiction they problem they had in the 1800s and early 1900s um, yeah this goes way back it's not the Chinese that control the communists and it's not any local country that control communist communist has always been the instrument of the central bankers right all the way back to the French Revolution it wasn't the French people it was the same sons of bitches whose names I cannot mention but you know who they are. Yep. <laughs> oh, you can mention them. <laughs> no, because uh, I, I might want to uh, mirror this conversation on my YouTube channel, so oh, I can't oh, mention yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a certain group of people who have a notorious reputation for the last 4,000 years of infiltrating, corrupting, and destroying every civilization they inhabited. That's who. Yeah. And, and, and as Amelia uh, said in the chat room, the dual citizens which is amazing in our country, you're allowed to have dual citizen leaders. You either have, I mean, you should either have allegiance to the United States or you do not have allegiance to the United States. You can't have allegiance to, to both two countries, but we know how that rolls. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit, a little about your six series, uh, your six episode series called Paradise Stolen. And if I may, can I play just the first 90 seconds of the myth of efficiency? Sure, go right ahead. Here we go. In my short video, Paradise Stolen, I made the claim that for the money, your money, spent in the past 10 years on war, the government could have built a small home on a small plot of land in a small community for every family in America. I and, and I'll stop right there. In your first video, you made the point for what the U.S. military spent, I think over a 10-year span, was it $6 trillion? Yeah. They could take like money and bought every single United States citizen a small plot of land in a house. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's think about that for a second. Let's go back to this. This as an analogy of what could be purchased for the money spent on illegal and immoral wars. I'm not saying that the government should build homes for every family in America. But then again, if you are determined to piss away six trillion dollars anyways, then why not spend it on a utopian dream that might benefit Americans? Could the outcome be worse than causing the gruesome death and destruction of millions of people? The arguments against such a proposal were what I expected. One argument claims that we are dreaming of an unworkable utopia and that that way of living is inefficient, impractical, and not cost effective. But these arguments are baseless and the result of lies and propaganda. We were lied to to convince us that the insanity of our current economic system is the only system that could work to keep us from living like free human beings instead of cattle on a giant tax farm. So allow me to dispel the myth that it is inefficient and impractical to live decent lives in decent communities. I'll take just one out of hundreds of possible examples I could have chosen from. This is a small town in the north. Their one and only industry is logging. They cut down the logs and load them onto trucks. The trucks drive hundreds of miles and load the logs onto trains. 
The trains travel hundreds of miles where the logs are loaded onto ships. The ships sail thousands of miles where the logs are loaded onto trucks. The trucks drive hundreds of miles where the logs are unloaded at a sawmill. The sawmill cuts the logs into lumber where it is loaded onto trucks that drive hundreds of miles to a manufacturing plant. The manufacturing plant turns the lumber into cutting boards. The cutting boards are loaded onto trucks. The trucks travel hundreds of miles where they are loaded onto ships. The ships travel thousands of miles where the boards are loaded onto trucks. The trucks drive hundreds of miles to be unloaded at a warehouse. They are then put on trucks again where they are delivered to retail stores. So, isn't that something? <laughs> yeah, no, the point I'm trying to make with that is, first of all, you have to understand that we are under an artificial scarcity. This is what the powers that be do. They right, and I, we talk about fear porn on this program all the time. They want to keep your vibration low. They want to keep your, your morale low. They want you to, just the same thing with COVID, right? They want to scare you to the point, please, government, please help us, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. They want us dependent on the government. Uh, but it, they are responsible for all the scarcity. Listen, we live in a world of unimaginable abundance. There is no oil shortage. There is no shortage of farmland to supply crops and, and, and uh, animals to feed the world ten times over. Even with eight billion people on the world, we can still feed everybody. There's enough gas and oil and lumber and steel. and All of this is an artificial scarcity. It's inflicted on us to make us think, oh, well, you know, we have to give up more. We have to, we have to sacrifice more so that, you know, because there's not enough. No, there's plenty. There's plenty to go around, and if we took just what we spend on the... You know, I don't understand this, George. You know, the American people, they sit back there. Now, we have... One of the things that really bothers me and hurts me is to see the unbelievable levels of homelessness. Travel anywhere in the United States, even small towns, have people sleeping in the streets. How is this possible? The richest, most resource-rich country in the world and there are people sleeping in minus 20 degree weather in a cardboard box under the freeway how is this possible when for the cost of just one of the middle east wars there we could have built everybody a home a nice home in a nice neighborhood i'm not talking stack them and pack them condominiums hundred story uh, ten stories tall hundred stories tall I'm talking about a nice cottage bungalow with a half acre and a garden and this is easily done it's cheaper it's more efficient than what they're doing right now but what they're doing is of course the most evil thing you can possibly do because the people we're dealing with are psychopaths they're evil they love misery and destruction but there is no natural reason for this we are very abundant, and that's what I tried to show in the series, Paradise Stolen. Not only that, you know, uh, uh, you know, the money we spend on the military could have solved all the problems. Well, I'm, I'm working on another video here. Uh, Canada spent how many trillions of dollars on vaccines? Oh, well, it was because you know the hospitals are overwhelmed. Why well, did the research? What does it cost to build a hospital? What well, cost about 350 million dollars to buy to build a small to medium-sized hospital. Now, for the money we spent on vaccines, we could have built 150 hospitals, brand new, throughout the country, and all the jobs that would create, the builders, the plumbers, the electricians, and all the sideline businesses that would benefit from that, the, the coffee trucks, the restaurants, the, the coffee shops, you know, it, it would have stimulated the economy, and then do you think we're gonna have a problem with uh, an overwhelming crisis in the healthcare system. We got lots of hospitals now, but no, we got to spend it on this poison first. Okay, we got to spend billions and billions of dollars to Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and uh, Moderna. Got to give them billions and billions of dollars rather than building more hospitals if we need them, and we probably do. What would be the best use for your money? You know, because I'm, I'm a very frugal guy. If I got ten bucks to spend. I go, well, what would be the best thing? Would it be lunch at a Chinese restaurant or should I go and buy 
you know, some some bulk food supplies that will last me a week. You know, I, I measure everything very carefully what I spend. Same thing with our government. Do we spend billions of dollars on this poison injection or do we build some more hospitals if that is the justification for this this, this, this poison routine that, they're, that they've got everybody into? What, that's their justification. Oh, it's going to overwhelm the, the NHS or, or the National Health and... Uh, anyways, look, um, we could have built those hospitals for the same money and building 150, 200 hospitals we contribute immensely to the economy, provide lots of good paying jobs. We could hire more doctors and more nurses and everybody could get decent medical care. What, you think decent medical care comes at the end of a needle? No, it doesn't. But this is what we're dealing with, George. You know, it's just, it's madness. Yeah, and unfortunately the people who have occupied the White House for the last however many decades, and like you said, uh, the Trudeaus, the 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 Jacinda Ardens, you know, all these psychopaths. The, the, the bottom line is the, the people at the top do not have uh, our best interests in their minds. That's why they have no problem perpetrating things like 9-11, like Waco, uh, Ruby Ridge, uh, sending 58,000 people to their deaths in Vietnam for no reason whatsoever except for drugs and uh, the military industrial complex and the, listen, the medical industrial complex, you know, we, we need hospitals, we need medical facilities, but when you start talking about the pharmaceutical industry, I mean, we're, we're talking crimes against humanity these last two and a half years. Oh, last hundred years. Listen, you know. I, well, yeah, it, but yeah, back to the early 1900s. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. it goes all the way back uh, when the Rockefellers took over. You know, before that, we had, uh, we had homeopathic and naturopathic medicine, mm -hmm. and uh, we had doctors that uh, actually provided medical care for their patients and that all changed over a hundred years ago so yeah um, uh, you know and 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 the money we could use like it, it pains me we had a guy here in Canada called Terry Fox and he lost a leg to cancer and he ran across country he ran uh, across all of Canada with with one artificial leg I remember he, that yeah and you know, just thinking about it makes me cry. This poor kid, this poor kid, he was just a young kid. He was like 23 or something like that. And he died of cancer anyways. He never made it all the way across. And uh, the pain and suffering. But to raise money for cancer research, how long ago was that? 30 years? 30 years ago? More. Wow, yeah. And uh, what did they do with that money? And what advances have they made in cancer treatment? None. Well, Nothing. no, cancer is a big business. They, they, they will never have a cure for cancer. They will never money. have a cure for cancer. Besides, there's already half a dozen cures for cancer. Sure. We know that. They've suppressed those cures. All those people that are dying slow, horrible, miserable deaths because of amputation and uh, surgery and chemotherapy, all of that's for nothing. They had the cure all along. And all the money, everybody that runs for breast cancer and walks for cancer and raising billions and billions of dollars, what do you, what do you think happens to that money? It goes straight into the pockets of the same central bankers that are behind everything. It's all for nothing. All the suffering poor Terry Fox went through accomplished zero, nothing, that poor kid. And um, it breaks my heart, you know, to see all the people that are dying and suffering from this. And it's all for the same reason. That's why, look, I know you want to ask me about the way of the warrior. That's why we have to become warriors. We need real men again in this world. You know, we have been attacked by we, I say, real honest masculine men have been attacked because they want to get rid of us because it's men, real men, that are the only solution to all the problems we need to stand up against these people we need to fight them on every level and until we do this inhumane monstrosity of a civilization we live in will continue yeah of course and that's exactly what the whole uh, lgbtq uh, lmnop agenda was all about it was a uh, feminizing men yes to take the warrior spirit out of them absolutely absolutely Listen, I grew up, when I was a young guy, I was in the, in the entertainment community. I worked at a recording studio. 
I dated movie stars. <laughs> I, was, I was better looking back then. Um, met a lot of gays, many, many gays, because they're all in the entertainment industry, you know, theater and, and things like that. Uh, nobody ever did anything against them. They weren't suppressed. They weren't oppressed. They had the freedom to do what they want. They went to their own clubs. Nobody bothered them. I, and then suddenly it's, oh, we got to have rights for the gays. What? What? Somebody took away their rights? When did that happen? But, of course, it's all just a big psyops. And now that they're teaching it in schools to poor, defenseless children, these monsters. By the way, folks, take your kids out of school. In my book, the, you know, The Complete Guide to Forming Communities, I have complete instructions on how to form your own homeschooling communities. Take your kids out of school. Don't, don't send them to that. It, it, it's inhumane to send a kid to public school. I call it child abuse. And teach your children yourself. Form a community and teach your own children. You can hire your own teachers, and they don't have to be gay or trans. They can be like normal people, and they can teach your children like important skills, like math and science and how to grow a garden. You know, get them out of the schools. Again, that's part of the forming a community. We have to provide for our own education for our own kids, and certainly never send your daughter or son to university. It's it, it it's an indoctrination center unless they, and and I used to say well unless they want to become an MD no don't don't send them not even to medical school because listen I know a few doctors uh, they're good friends of mine and I speak to them and I said so your MD degree is it of any goddamn use whatsoever tell me the truth and they'll admit they said no we never learned anything they didn't yes they got they know the Latin names for a bunch of anatomical parts and they know the Latin names for a bunch of diseases you and I we call it bronchitis they'll call it something else sounds all very official they don't know what the F they're doing they don't I wouldn't trust the doctor for anything other than my one friend he's an emergency room doctor if I needed him to set a broken leg okay I trust him for that but if you come down with cancer or diabetes or some other goddamn disease um, forget about the doctors doing anything. They know nothing. Nothing. So I, I wouldn't send a, anybody to university for anything. Maybe engineering, but then you're better off at a trade school for that anyways. So what do you do? You've got to form a community. You've got to form your own homeschooling. And I'm in touch with people that do school the, in my community here. Um, they do their own homeschooling. And you know what? I know their kids. Their kids are wonderful kids. They're loving, they're friendly, they're sweet. Um, yeah, unlike anything you get out of public school. So, yeah, Spot on. there we go uh, again, you know. To support your statement, death by metal error. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. What did no, you you're right, you're right, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, death by medical error or accident is the nation's leading cause uh, of accidental death. And it just by leaps and bounds, uh, so many stories you hear all the time. And, of course, the cure for cancer, uh, poisoning you. Uh, it's just another one of the Rockefeller ways of depopulating suffering. Yeah. Yep. Um, I haven't been to a doctor in 40 years. I had to renew my, my health card, and I went in there. And I said, I'm so-and-so. Here's the information. Here's my ID. And they, they went into the computer, and they go, you have never been to a doctor here? <laughs> I said, no. Why would I go to a doctor? I don't trust them. They don't know what the hell they're doing. I'm better off doing a little bit of research, taking care of myself. I know my body. I know when I'm sick, and I know when I'm not sick, and I know what's wrong with me. And what do we need a doctor for? So, and, 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 and the reason I can credit the fact that I haven't been sick in 40 years is because I haven't been to a doctor in 40 years. You know, there you go, direct correlation. There you go. And I wanted to ask you one more question, then we'll, if anybody wants to call and we'll open the phone lines for a few minutes. Uh, you're real, you had a viral video that you did about 12 years ago, Defense Against the Psychopath. And we've mentioned the word psychopath uh, many times on this program today. What is Defense Against uh, that document, uh, excuse me, the documentary, Defense Against the Psychopath, all about? Well, listen, we, you have to identify your enemy. This is what, you know, this goes back to martial arts, this goes back to military strategy 
And this goes back to Sun Tzu, the famous Chinese strategist, who wrote the book The Art of War. And he wrote that if you want to be able to defeat your enemy, you must know your enemy. So who are the enemies of mankind? Those enemies are what we call the psychopaths. Now, if you are more of a Christian, you could say they're demons. They're off-world uh, archons. They're demonically possessed people. That's what they are. They're evil. And unless you understand psychopaths, it will be a hard time for you to navigate all the things that happen in our society. Because a lot, you know, a lot of times people, you know, we try to wake them up, right, George? We try to wake people up, give them the red pill. And often the excuse is, well, you know, the government wouldn't do that to us. The government wouldn't genocide us. That's the, the number one answer. Nobody would do that. Yeah, the, the doctors wouldn't poison us and try and kill us. You know, everybody believes this stuff, but don't believe it because among every hierarchical institution, where when you have a situation where there is power and influence and money, that institution will attract, like, sh like flies to shit, they will attract psychopaths. And psychopaths will, in short order, take over every institution in your society. They'll take over the medical institution. They'll take over the educational system. They'll take over the banking system. They'll take over the military. They'll take over the government. Because that's what psychopaths do. And you have to understand the mentality of psychopaths is they love misery and suffering. It doesn't matter if Bill Gates is the richest man in the world. If he's got billions or trillions of dollars, that's not enough for him. It's not enough for him. What would be enough is when he sees the rest of the world on their knees groveling in the dirt. Now he starts to get more happy. See, this is what, what, what the psychopaths are. They enjoy misery and suffering and, and death and, and, and corruption. That's what they like. That's what turns their cranks. They did studies. You know, they did MRI uh, scans on the brains of healthy, normal people and on the brains of psychopaths. And with normal people, they would be monitoring their brain and they would flash photos of, like, puppies and bunnies and children playing in the sunshine and you know and they would measure the brain reactions now with normal healthy people the pleasure part of the brain will light up normal healthy people like to see puppies and kitties and and children playing in the grass that's normal with the psychopaths the pleasure center does not light up they get no pleasure from seeing puppies and kittens and all that now you flash pictures of dismembered bodies and, 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 and people in chains and abused animals. Now, in normal human beings, they show that the brain that deals with suffering and misery and negative emotions lights up. We are naturally horrified by suffering and violence, but on the psychopath's brains, their pleasure center lights up. Why do you think they torture and murder children? Because children are the most innocent, the most beautiful young people in the planet, and most of us, we have, you know, we, we, see, we feel pleasure at seeing children playing, and, but for the psychopath to see children being brutalized, and tortured, and raped, that's what lights up the pleasure center in their brain. And until you understand that, you won't understand why the world is the way it is. The world is the way it is is because it's run by psychopaths. And psychopaths love misery. That's why you see what you're seeing today. Great stuff. I do have a couple more questions to ask you, but I do want to offer if the audience, if anybody out there wants to call us and ask you a question, I want to afford them that chance. So... Uh, let's open up the phone lines. 
The Fact Hunter is ready to take your call. Join the program by calling 302-526-4761. That's 302-526-4761. Let the world know what's on your mind. Now let's get back to your host, the Fact Hunter himself, George Hobbs. All right, again, folks, it's 302-526-4761, 302-526-4761. If you have any questions for Stefan Verstappen, um, you know, we talk about these psychopaths, uh, and it's amazing. I always say, could you imagine being a perpetrator be- between 9-11 and be able to sleep at night? And that's why I always say, are these people even earthly beings? You know, the people who reside uh, in Palestine, uh, you know, and a lot, listen, there's a lot of evil in Rome and Switzerland, too. Yeah. But the true perpetrators of 9-11, is it a bloodline thing? Do you think they're even of this, are they fallen angels? I, I like to ask every guest uh, this type of question. Well, you know, I'm very pragmatic. And, uh, at, you know, I'm a notorious skeptic. So I've heard those other explanations. Um Maybe they're archons now, for the people that don't know. Archons are um, interdimensional evil entities that seem to want to influence this world. Now, if you just look at these signs and symptoms, I can't argue against the archons. It, it's as if these people are possessed by demons or interdimensional uh, creatures that have no humanity at all. They don't. That would be an adequate explanation. I'm still staying with the uh, Occam's razor. Uh, I personally feel that there's a certain tribe that are genetic psychopaths. They've been bred and interbred for thousands of years to promote the most psychopathic traits among their descendants and if you view this as purely a psychopathic manifestation then there's no need for demons then there's no need for archons or interdimensional or uh, ETs or anything like that there's no need for that because the, 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 the psychopathic mindset explains this already the other thing about the psychopathic mindset is that it is parasitic I've always tried to find like a natural explanation for things. Uh, early on, I you know I studied predator and prey, so maybe these people are just natural predators. Um, and there are predators within our society. They're the robbers. They're the rapists. They might not necessarily be psychopaths. Probably they are, but it's not necessary that they are the psychopaths. They're just you know low IQ. Uh, they don't have any other ways of thinking. And so they become predators. But there is a third life form, and that is the parasite. And when you study the life cycle of the parasite, then you realize that this certain tribe fits the description of a parasitic organism perfectly. They go from host to host. We've seen that now. You know, uh, I've traced them back 4,000 years, George. Ever since 9-11, I went, who the F are these sons of bitches, you know, I'm tracing them, I'm tracing them back, oh, I, I traced them back to Egypt, and they're the Hyksos, I traced them back to Babylonian, and they're the Ibiru, um, I traced them back further, and they're, you know, close cousin to the gypsies, um, but for these thousands of years, they have the same modus operandi, and that modus operandi is like a parasite. Now, a parasite will infect a host usually through disguise so oh here they come oh they're they're refugees poor me we were unfairly persecuted by the next country over and they kicked us out and please help us and so you let them in then absolutely so then the next thing they do is they immediately begin work to subvert your society and uh, for example the slave trade what other parasites do in nature is they bring with them diseases, bacteria, and other viruses. And the reason they bring these other bacteria and viruses in with them is so that the body, the host, 
doesn't recognize the source of their illness. So you get sick, but you're sick because of all the other diseases the parasite brings with it. So your body can't isolate the cause of its illness, which would be the parasite that you, you know, infiltrated your body in the first place. And so these let's can we pause for one second. We do have a caller, actually. Okay, uh, sure. Let's let's take a call. Yeah, Eric seven two seven. What's your name? Where you're calling from? Uh, this is Johnny from Los Angeles. Hey, Johnny, what's going on? What's your question for uh, Stefan? Well, I heard him mention a name in Bill Gates when he's talking about a psychopath. I can tell you for 100% fact, Bill Gates is not a psychopath. Now, I met him once, about 30 years back, and uh, I wound up in a very small room with him by myself one time. I actually saw this man with my own two eyes manifest from a human form to a demonic form and back to a human form. So I, there may be all kinds of psychopaths out here that are, that are involved in all this. But I can tell you that, that one isn't. So well, you to Yeah, what would you think he was what then? That, what, what do I think he was? Yeah. I haven't the slightest idea. I haven't the slightest idea. In those days, now I'm, I'm religious now. I have gained that in life. But back in those days, I wasn't. Didn't have any knowledge of that or, or thought of that much one or another. But I know what I saw with my own two eyes. This is not a psychopath. This is something, something demonic. That's all I can tell you. I saw it with my own two eyes. Well, I believe so, you. Hey, you know, there's at least one that is in a psychopath. I you. No, I believe you. And, and again, like I'm on the fence about this. You know, I'm still looking for a natural explanation that I could explain through nature. And, and, and you know, the parasitic uh, cycle, you know, seems to explain it pretty good. But I'm not sure that it isn't demonic. Now, I have to do say, I do have to say, psychopaths are able to act normal, right? Otherwise, you know, people would, they wouldn't get where they are. They're able to mimic us. So they can appear human, but because of their psychopathy, they aren't really human. A psychopath is not a human being. But you know what? I've heard this before. I don't say that you're wrong, buddy. I don't say that you're wrong at all. And uh, what you saw with your own eyes, I will take that into account. Um, it could very well be that these people are possessed by something from out of this world. They're not human. So thank you for, for yeah. telling me that story. I appreciate okay. it. Okay, yeah, thanks, you have Scott. a good appreciate day. Okay, bye now. All right, take care now. This is Johnny from L.A. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, Stefan, we've got about uh, two minutes left. Uh, I'd like to offer you the floor, uh, any websites, how people can contact you, any closing thoughts? Sure. Well, uh, my main website is chinastrategies.com. And as you find out, George, I know you went, you went to my website and you're going through it. Holy shit, I didn't know you did all this stuff. Yeah, it, it's, it's a big jumble. The reason I named it China Strategies is um, when my first book came out in 1999, everybody said, oh, you got to get a website. And I'm going, oh, well, okay. So I, I chose the URL, China Strategies, because that was the name of my first book. And since then, I've just uploaded everything I've done onto that website. I didn't change the URL to stefan.com or whatever. I just kept it because uh, I was too lazy to get another URL. <laughs> I just uploaded everything. So it's all up there. Uh, my books, my writings, my martial arts, uh, videos, even my art and my uh, canoe videos and my bicycle trail videos and, and my music videos and my art everything is up on that website so it's very confusing you go there and you think oh I'm going to see like a survivalist website no you're not <laughs> it's part of it but it's all up there so uh, it's m everything about me is on that website the other website I have now for my next book, and finally I took a URL that rec represents the book, and it's called formingcommunities.com. And that's exclusively about my upcoming book, my online course, and like I said, there are uh, PDF files you can download right now for free that will explain a lot of what I'm trying to do with communities. 
And if you want to sign up for, for the course, you can do that there. And it's called formingcommunities.com. And uh, my YouTube channel, it's Stefan Verstappen. I know it, it, it's, a, it's a big name. It's not a name I, wa I would have chosen for myself. I would have preferred, uh, if I had to give myself a name, it would be like Jake Steele. You know, <laughs> Stefan for stopping. Who can remember that and who can spell it? But anyways, uh, you're going to have to go to uh, George's website and look for the link. He'll have links to my all my uh, social media on his website. That will be the easiest thing. So um, go to facthunter.com and uh, you'll see the links there. Yeah, and, and I'll post one of your videos on my website today, too. I'll, I'll post that Paradise Stolen series and maybe even uh, the Psychopath video. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. Thank you uh, to Johnny from L uh, L.A. for the phone call. Thanks for everyone in the chat room, and thank you for listening on this July 18th, 2022, with our special guest, Stefan Verstappen. Until Wednesday at 10 a.m., we'll see you next time, folks. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening.